What we see here are two species of wild petunia, petunia axillaris and petunia excerta. They're very closely related. But as you can see, the flowers are very different. Uh, these flowers are white, these are red, and there are also differences in flower morphology. For instance, very importantly, in the red flower, uh, the reproductive organs, the stigma and the stamens are sticking out, and they're not sticking out in the white flowers. What you cannot see is the difference in smell. Uh, these flowers emit a strong, sweet smell, especially at night. The red flowers are not fragrant at all. What is the functional significance of these differences? Each of these flowers is adapted to a specific pollinator. The white scented flowers attract nocturnally active hawk moth. White color and strong fragrance are obviously useful at low light intensities. Red flowers with protruding reproductive organs are typical for pollination by hummingbirds. The research question we are asking is, which are the genes that had to change to evolve from a hawk moth to a bird pollinated flower? In this work, we focus on the genes responsible for fragrance production. Uh, we make use of the fact that these two species are so closely related that they can interbreed and form viable offspring. What you see here is the analysis of 203 plants of an F2 population. We measured the emission of the major scent compound, methyl benzoate. There are 51 plants that produce no fragrance at all, whereas the other 152 produce scent from very low levels to even more than the parent. Our simple hypothesis is that there is a single gene that determines presence or absence of scent and additional genes responsible for the quantity of scent production. This is confirmed by quantitative trait locus, QTL analysis. There are two very well supported loci, one on chromosome 2 and one on chromosome 7, and at least one further locus on chromosome 3. The locus on chromosome 7 perfectly co-segregates with a gene called odorant 1, a MIP transcription factor with a known function in scent production. In fact, expression analysis strongly suggests that odor 1 is the gene underlying the QTL on chromosome 7. Next, we performed reciprocal introgressions of the two major loci into the parental backgrounds. So we end up with two new plants. One we call WNS, white non-scented. It is genetically identical to its parents, except for the QTL on chromosome 2. Phenotypically, it is like its parents, except it does not smell. The other plant we call RS, red scented. It is genetically identical to the other parent, except for the QTL on chromosome 2 and 7. Phenotypically, it is like its parent, except it smells. So we have two pairs of plants that differ from the parent only in whether they smell or not. Here, we are testing the preference of the pollinator in a dual choice experiment. The plants are placed upwind. Plant volatiles are carried by the airflow towards the insect and the insect will fly upwind. When the insect has the choice between the two wild species, it flies towards the white scented one. No surprise there. In the next experiments, we let the insect choose between plants that differed in scent but not in color. In both the case of the white phenotypes and the red phenotypes, the insects show a clear preference for the flower that emits scent. In the final experiment, the insects are exposed to conflicting cues. One plant produces scent but has the wrong color, the other plant has the right color but produces no scent. The insects still fly upwind but now show no preference for either type of flower over the other. So, what do we learn from these experiments? First, the genetic architecture of the trait fragrance is surprisingly simple. The white plant needs to change only one locus to lose fragrance. And the red plant needs to change only two loci to turn fragrance back on. This means that when the two species hybridize in the wild, they have the potential to switch quickly between absence and presence of fragrance. Second, the pollinator can discriminate between plants that differ only in fragrance. That suggests that by just exchanging the fragrance genes, they can affect pollinator behavior. This might be an advantage when the usual pollinator is absent. 
Third, hawk moth pollinators use both visual and olfactory cues, and at least under our highly standardized conditions, these two cues are equivalent.